this is lecture 12, uh, the last one before the first exam. Uh, we'll finish up specificity of adaptation. These are the three themes we'll be covering, uh, how stress bolsters health, uh, how stress can lead to pathology if it's inappropriately applied, and a little bit about the range of possible adaptations. So let's begin with broccoli. Uh, this is a concept we talked about earlier at the beginning of lecture three. Uh, broccoli has no muscle, so it can't swat away pests. It has to synthesize pesticides uh, like sulforaphane. And eating it is healthful uh, for us uh, in part because it's a stressor. It's a manageable stressor though. And the concept of stressors impart healthful benefits applies to numerous contexts, not just broccoli. Uh, now, not all stress is good, just as not all stress is bad, but it's sometimes surprising what bad stresses turn out to contribute to the greater good. So this is a study from the 80s that followed shipyard workers for nearly the whole decade, and they tracked their health outcomes. They're categorized into three different groups, uh, there are about 30,000 subjects who were exposed to high doses of radiation, uh, 30,000 more who weren't exposed, and there were about 10,000 subjects in the middle who were exposed to a low dose of radiation. And what we'd expect to find is that the higher dose of radiation would associate with health complications because radiation damages cells. We know this. And at, at high levels, it can kill those cells. I mean, it gives people cancer. Radiation is bad. And a long-term follow-up study on people exposed to it should confirm that. But what was actually found uh, was the high-dose workers, the workers exposed to high doses of radiation demonstrated significantly lower circulatory, respiratory, and all-cause mortality uh, compared to the unexposed workers. Uh, what turned out to be true was a sort of stress inoculation. Uh, when we're exposed to stress, our body develops resistance to it. If we aren't exposed to stress, we lose that resistance. It atrophies. Uh, now, this is true for muscle, uh, unloaded muscle atrophies, and we wind up with sarcopenia. Uh, this is true with bone, unloaded bone degenerates, and we wind up with osteoporosis. This is true with the immune system. Uh, it's true with the antagonistry system. Uh, if you have calluses from a sport or a stringed instrument and you stop playing that sport or instrument, the calluses go away. Uh, and this is also true with psychological stresses. Uh, just as we can overdo radiation and, and wind up with severe complications, we can overdo any stressor. We can overdo muscular exertion and wind up with strains. We can overdo bone loading and wind up with breaks. We can overdo immune uh, exposure and, and, and find ourselves sick. And we can overdo psychological stress and wind up with PTSD. But we can also underdo all of these and wind up with atrophy. So consider the implication of this principle on how we're constructing society. Uh, safe spaces are healthy recovery spaces to heal and find balance and have control over our environments. But if we don't also expose ourselves to unsafe spaces, we atrophy. We lose our ability to cope. And if these faculties atrophy enough, the tiniest psychological or emotional discomfort sends us tumbling into turmoil. Mental stress and, and discomfort bolster our health, just as radiation in the right dose bolsters our health, and exercise in the right dose bolsters our health. Only stress can protect us against stress. We just need to dose it right. But sometimes we do a bad job of dosing our psychological and physical stresses. Uh, remember the Rostai case from lecture one? Uh, we went over the risk factors for exercise. If you exhibit these signs and symptoms, uh, or if you have a history of, the, of these particular diagnoses, we have to be extra cautious because exercise, just like psychological stress and climate factors such as heat, can be dangerous if we aren't acclimated to it. 
uh, dosing our stress is what's important. Too little stress is bad, right? It leads to decay. Too much stress is also bad. It leads to illness and injury, maybe PTSD, maybe overtraining syndrome, uh, and some physical symptoms characterized by Cellier's gas, right? But right in the middle, that's where you want to be. For your immune system, for your muscular system, your skeletal system, your cardiovascular system, every other system, the Goldilocks space is where you want to reside. Dosing it with plenty of unsafe spaces and recovering in safe spaces, but then getting right back out there into the unsafe spaces again uh, at a higher dose uh, and then recovering again, uh, and then increasing the dose again. That's the progressive overload principle. We all have to begin with mild stressors, but the more conditioned we become to those stressors, the more we can handle. And not just that, but the more we have to handle, if we want to continue to improve, Goldilocks is a moving target. The more stress you expose yourself to, the harder she is to reach. If you've ever played an RPG, like a role-playing game, a video game, where you have to level up, going from level one to level two takes a tiny amount of experience points. Going from level two to level three also takes a tiny amount. Then, you know, going up the next level, that takes a little bit more. The next level takes a little bit more and the next level a little bit more and more and more and more. And the higher the level you reach, the harder it is to level up. The same is true with our adaptation to stress. The, pre the um, trainability principle applies here. At the onset of, of, of exercise uh, or training of any kind, improvement is rapid, but the more you train, the less rapid it becomes, uh, the more investment is required to get any dividends, and eventually you'll hit a plateau. The dose response curve also applies here. Uh, the greater the dose, the greater the result. Within reason, uh, you have to be in proximity to Goldilocks if you want your investment to really you know, pay out. Um, so those principles we talked about in lecture two, the dose response curve, the trainability principle, the progressive overload principle, these really factor into our response to stress. Uh, but it's different for different people. If someone who has never run a marathon uh, before runs a marathon, or if someone who's really like never run at all before, you can run your first marathon. But if somebody has never run more than two miles, let's say, and then they go running a marathon, they are likely to hurt themselves. Um, if no, if if somebody has like never played guitar before, and then they play for six hours those strings are going to be covered in blood, right? But elite athletes will find Goldilocks at really intense difficulties. An NBA player can handle a much higher stress load uh, and adapt positively to it. Uh, if the same amount of stress is endured by the average person, it's going to result in at least overreaching, if not injury. Uh, now, the breadth of the changes you experience depend on the breadth of stresses you endure. If you're training your cardiovascular system with swimming, you're not training your skeletal system. If you're training your skeletal and skeletal muscle systems with heavy resistance training, you're not training your cardiovascular system. Exercise doesn't exercise everything. Exercise only exercises what you're exercising. Now there's some vocabulary uh, for the different ways of inducing these adaptations. Um, acclimation is doing it in a lab, okay? It's simulating heat in a lab or simulating cold in a lab, simulating high altitude in a lab or low altitude uh, or any other environmental stressor. Simulating that stuff in a lab is acclimation. Acclimatization is the actual outdoors. Uh, it's nature itself we're adapting to, acclimatization. Not all adaptation is good though. Uh, sometimes we exercise or expose ourselves to environmental stressors and the adaptations that follow are unhealthy. Uh, remember in the last lecture when Christopher Hitchens questioned the wisdom of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? Uh, if the stress we apply is inappropriate, your adaptations will be specific to that inappropriate stress. 
which means your adaptations will be undesirable. Uh, the person who best illustrated this phenomenon is Katie Bowman. Uh, in the first chapter of her book, Move Your DNA, she gets into the orca, um, the central attraction of SeaWorld. Um, now, true credit uh, for this uh, goes to this master's student whose thesis uh, was a beautiful deep dive into flaccid fin syndrome. The fins aren't actually flaccid, right? They're very firm. Uh, so FFS can also stand for folded fin syndrome. Uh, now, in the wild, there's a little bit of this. Dorsal fins are not perfectly straight in every orca in every ocean. Uh, the rates of deformity depend where you see them. Um, in this study in New Zealand, uh, out of every 30, out of just 30, I guess, surface-dwelling adults, uh, nearly a quarter might have some degree of deformity. Um, in Norway, there was almost none. There was you know, one out of 174. So it depends on a lot. Um, but rarely would a wild orca have a sea world fin sagging down onto its side. Uh, whereas in captivity, you see that exact morphological change in pretty close to 100% of adults. Um, they just need to remain there long enough and the adaptation will set in. Um, so, and like, how could it not? How could this adaptation not set in? Uh, given the physical loads they experience, it's surface swimming in a counterclockwise circle over and over and over. If we did a side bend exercise in one direction for half our lives, and you know we were unable to get any other exercise, our spines would be Sea World spectacles too, um, or we'd be visiting physical therapists for problematic deformities. Uh, now the last explanation here is dietary. These the orca they're eating frozen like dead fish and, and gelatin, right? Not living animals. And the, the nutrient profiles will change. Uh, but the mechanical profiles, that's what's most important um, and certainly most relevant to the specificity of adaptation. Now, linking diet and movement in a conceptual way, uh, we all know the nutrient label that appears on our foods, uh, how much fat and cholesterol and sodium and carbs and protein and vitamins and minerals, you know, how much of all of that stuff it has, uh, that nutrient label. Uh, exercise is just as varied, uh, except instead of macro and micronutrients, we have different characteristics of tension, right, of load, think size principle, uh, and duration, also think size principle, um, and angles, think length, uh, length tension relationship. Uh, is it static or dynamic exercise? Is it, wow. uh, you know, concentric, right? That, that differs markedly from eccentric or eccentric stress. Um, and we'll talk about that later this semester, but there are as many features of exertional stress as there are of ingestional, I'm not sure if that's a word, but but you, you get what I'm saying, which is, um, paraphrasing a point made by Katie Bowman, uh, which is that we can have a nutritional profile of exercise every bit as detailed as the nutritional profile of food. And just like you can't eat one food for the rest of your life and be healthy, you know, I'm only going to eat oranges, let's say, you know, okay, you'll get tons of vitamin C, uh, you know, a tiny bit of B6 and tons of sugar. You're going to have so many health problems, you know, before the month is up and before the year is up, certainly if you don't eat a variety of foods and the same is true with exercise, you know, I'm just going to jog for the rest of my life. Um, I'll sit down every other hour and then jogging is the only exercise I'll do. Um, but that's okay because I sit that much because I jog once a day. Like that's like eating an orange every day. If there's no variety, uh, then you know it's not as healthy as as people think. Um, in a way, your body, your physical form is autobiographical. It documents every stress and writes their passages into its cells. Um, Wolf's Law into your bones, Davis's Law into your soft tissues, Delorme into your muscles, Adolf into all of your physiological capacities. The summation of all of that is what you see in the mirror. 
Um, and so uh, there are conditions in which over uh, eagerness of, of, of adaptation would threaten our survival. Okay, so if we go from this before here to that after, after you know a couple of exercise programs, um, this threatens us. So specificity of adaptation is the amount of adaptation you experience, also included, because um, protein translation, synthesizing proteins, this is so expensive metabolically. It's so expensive. Um, an unnecessary adaptation would use valuable resources uh, that could go into other features of survival. Um, and some adaptations, like hypertrophy, for example, will increase basal metabolism. Um, every day while you're sitting there, your resting metabolism expends more calories. Uh, your body is going to be reluctant to do this uh, unless the added muscle allows you to procure more food and and, and meet that metabolism. But yes, the bones and muscles are bigger, but it allows you to bag a bigger animal uh, or climb more banana trees or whatever. Um, so the investment has to pay for itself. You remodel your body and that costs a lot of calories, but your body is now capable of bringing in more calories as a result of the remodel. Um, so let's look at how an organism responds to stress. Um, with unpleasant but unthreatening things, we just tolerate it. Uh, you know, I don't like this very much, but I'll get through it. You know, maybe we accommodate, we sweat to cope with the heat, something like that. If the stress is considerable, uh, but we rarely do it, uh, like you know, mowing a big lawn once a summer, uh, we'll accommodate to the best of our ability. Uh, maybe this guy doing Bikram curls you know, for an hour or something like that. You know, his body will buffer acids and it'll sweat to cool. Um, it'll alter substrate availability. But these are all short-term. Um, these changes stop when the exercise, when the, when the stress stops. Uh, it, that's not an adaptation. It's a way of managing the acute threat. Uh, but if we continue to experience that threat, depending on what it is, we'll probably adapt to the best of our ability, but not beyond uh, that ability, not beyond the stresses. Um, you know, this man, he like did not adapt uh, to be able to lift big weights, right? He, he adapted to lift the pink ones in an intense way uh, so that in future bouts of lifting pink dumbbells, he wouldn't risk injury and he wouldn't experience as much exertional pain uh, and he, he wouldn't accumulate as much internal heat and he wouldn't be so sore afterward. Lots of adaptations, but he won't adapt to 25 pound dumbbells by lifting the fives. That's specificity of adaptation. Um, and evolution is, again, adaptation at the level of the species. Low hanging fruit is only low hanging until it's ingested. Uh, then there's no more low hanging fruit and all that's left is high hanging fruit. So if you're a giraffe who can't reach it, you starve. Uh, so it's lethal not to be tall as a giraffe. Um, so only the long necked giraffes reproduce. If it became lethal not to be a basketball player, the average human height would increase too. Uh, the entire species adapts according to the specificity of the stress or the stresses uh, that threaten its ability to flourish, but it's not changing at the level of the individual. Um, so another example would be that menopause and reproduction, right? On average, women go through menopause somewhere around 50, 51, somewhere around there. And some, though, will go through it in their early 40s. Others go through it in their late 50s. If there was some new law enacted that said humans can't procreate until they're 55, right? Everyone who goes through menopause early would be out of the gene pool, and the ability to have babies later in life would be a phenotypic trait of all humans, uh, just like long necks of, of giraffes. Um, and you can see phenotypic differences from species to species in the musculature too. Uh, a duck breast compared to a chicken breast.
I mean, the muscle on the left, very oxidative. And it needs to be because ducks do a lot of flying. The muscle on the right is remarkably unoxidative uh, because the animal it comes from is not much of a flyer. Uh, now, skeletal muscle is extremely adaptable at the level of individuals, but every species has developed their musculature specifically according to the stresses the species has endured. Um, so if you compare the muscle function of a bivalve mollusk and a frog, you see interesting differences. Um, the survival of mollusks, like this scallop that's pictured here, depends on long and, and strong isometric contractions. Um, the muscles that perform these isometric holds are shaped by evolutionary pressures to perform that specific function. That specificity of adaptation at the level of the species. The survival of a frog uh, depends on something different. It's, it depends on more explosive, powerful leaping. So a scallop cannot possibly produce the power uh, of a frog leg, and a frog leg cannot possibly produce the isometric force and efficiency of a mollusk's retractor muscles. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't improve. It, does, it doesn't mean we're stuck with the capacities we were assigned at birth. Um, just like we can become more tan, we can improve our power and our endurance and isometric strength and every other function of our muscle. You know, we can't become an antelope, uh, but we can improve our 10K time. Um, I can't change the race of my skin, but I can change my pigmentation within a pretty broad range assigned by my genetics. Uh, now, the type of training we do matters, obviously. Isometric exercise doesn't really improve our, dy our dynamic uh, abilities and vice versa. Um, whatever specific action you're training, that's what you're improving uh, without much overlap in other functions. Um, so the same is true with uh, concentric and eccentric or eccentric uh, activations. If you want to get good at concentric, do concentric. If you want to get better at eccentric, do eccentric uh, exercises. Uh, but training adaptations get even more specific um, than simply like dynamic improves dynamic and isometric improves isometric. Um, there's a phenomenon called angular specificity, uh, which is that Whatever angle you train at, that's the angle you respond to. If you subject your tissues to the same anatomical position over and over and over, experiencing isometric stress at that specific angle, um, or if you train dynamically through a really narrow range of motion, the cellular adaptations induced by that stress will permit you to tolerate that stress specifically. Your tissues will make changes to accommodate that exact limited region, providing better mechanical and metabolic functioning in that precise anatomical position. Uh, in lecture four, we talked about the length-tension relationship. And in lecture three, uh, we talked about sarcomerogenesis and sarcomerolysis. That's part of what's going on here. You have proteins that serve as mechanical sensors like titan and integrins, which we'll get into later this semester. Um, and these proteins notice the characteristics of the load, that nutrition profile of the load. And all adaptations will be aimed at optimizing this specific performance. Your body will just figure out ways to enhance endurance, how to buffer metabolic byproducts, how to deal with occluded blood supply, uh, you know, maybe put more myoglobin in there, um, in addition to sarcomerogenesis or sarcomerolysis, depending on the joint length. Uh, and the bulk of your adaptation is going to be at that exact position. Uh, if you train at 90 degrees every single workout, you're not really improving at all at 45 or 120 degrees. You're improving at 90 degrees.
I think you get some uh, benefit as you move away from the trained angle, but there are diminishing returns with elbow flexors. Hold it at 90 degrees, and you can expect some improvement from maybe a 70 to 110, something like that. But the most at exactly 90 degrees, less at 95, even less at 100, and so on. Uh, now, in more lengthened states, uh, you'll see a little bit better range of improvement into those contracted states. But the more contracted states tend to have narrow ranges of improvement in the lengthened uh, states. Um, and similar results uh, to the elbow flexors you can expect with most muscle groups, like right? quads and plantar flexors and whatever. Now, how we perform our exercises, that matters too. Uh, if you do sit-ups with anchored feet, you change the recruitment patterns. Let's say there's a fitness test that you have to perform. You know, maybe it's for elementary school PE, maybe it's for a sport, maybe it's for the military. You know, whatever the reason, uh, you or someone you know is, is going to uh, undergo a test and you want to train yourself or that person for that test. If the test will be performed without anchored feet and you train with anchored feet, you're not really improving, not improving for the test at least. Uh, now, sometimes what we do is like a little bit helpful, you know, if we're, if we're training wrong, but maybe it's a little bit helpful. Other times it's just innocuous. It's not harmful. And then other times it actually is harmful. Our training, our effort can be harmful. The body is built in opposing directions. For every bicep, there's a tricep. Uh, for every insulin, there's a glucagon. For every agonist, you'll find an antagonist. Everything has an opposing force. That's just how you're built. And you can't continue developing and expanding in all directions all the time. Uh, training for one goal often takes away from another. Uh, so, uh, for example, if you're a speed and power athlete, and then you start trying to also compete in an aerobic sport, you'll compromise your strength uh, and your, your progress and strength workouts. Um, we'll talk about the, the research on this and the mechanisms for it later this semester. Um, but unless you're a beginner, you'll find disparate physio, uh, physical goals will often oppose each other. Um, so it's important to perform a task analysis before coming up with an exercise intervention. Uh, figure out what the exact stresses and demands are for your sport or whatever your, your uh, physical undertaking is, and then you can come up with an effective exercise prescription. Uh, so that's what Gil Reyes did with Andre Agassi. Uh, he, and he went, Agassi went on to become one of the greatest tennis players of all time after this. Um, some of that task analysis is characterized by this conversation, which comes from his book. Um, Andre Agassi was running five miles a day. Reyes saw the foolishness in that. And part of his training prescription was to have Agassi stop doing that. So a lot of times stopping things is part of your exercise prescription, stopping um, harmful things. Um, so with this in mind, what adaptations would you expect if you walked for an hour a day? Um, would those be different if you jogged 30 minutes a day? And would that be different from sprinting for 30 seconds a day? Uh, or doing plyometrics or Tai Chi or yoga? Uh, and, and, and what if you were doing those things in the heat uh, or the cold, or if you were being punched, right? A uh, hint to, uh, to answering all of these, these questions. Improvements will never be general and cellier-like. They'll be specific to the stresses being endured in your training. Broad, sweeping, imprecise improvements in body systems would be too metabolically expensive. Um, so if you run a lot, uh, your body will make all sorts of physiological changes to specifically improve the ability to run and little else. Uh, if you play a lot of hockey, right, your body will adapt in ways that improve your performance on the ice. And if you get punched a lot, 
Uh, here's Mike Tyson talking about contact adaptation. Uh, he's describing his preparation for his fight with Peter McNeely, which I watched on pay-per-view during the summer before my freshman year of high school. Uh, Tyson talks about getting out of prison and sparring for practice and taking body blows from an amateur kid. Uh, and, and, and Tyson is calling it early because he hadn't been punched in a long time and it hurt. The contact adaptation um, he had previously uh, developed had atrophied. It had basically vanished, uh, which was to be expected because that's how everything works. It's use it or lose it. And your muscle, um, if you're not using it, you'll lose it. Uh, with your bones, if you're not using them, you'll lose them. Your coping skills, if you don't use them, you lose them. And getting punched? Um, if you don't get punched, you lose your contact adaptation. So think about like American football. Athletes tend to get injured by hits earlier in the season. Uh, but as that season progresses, uh, they take those hits better. No one knows exactly how it works. It's probably changes in the matrix of the muscle. Uh, but whatever the alteration, athletes can better tolerate contact stresses. That's specificity of adaptation. Uh, but whatever the stresses and loads you subject your body to, it will respond according to those inputs. Um, sometimes this results in optimal changes. Uh, we also know that if you stop exposing your body to stresses, atrophy will result. But other times the inputs result in pathological changes. Um, now, we don't have dorsal fins that can fold uh, along our backs, but we do have other anatomical structures. We have elbows and ankles and knees and backs, and these things behave exactly like a dorsal fin would uh, in terms of how they respond to mechanical loads. Uh, and sometimes when we wrap these things uh, up tightly, uh, th then that changes our, our mechanical signaling. Um, so think what happens to your teeth when you have braces on for a few months. Joints and skeletal muscles undergo changes too. So swaddle your knee like an infant and the firing patterns are likely to change. Um, and that's a stimulus for adaptation. So just consider the implications of wrapping. I'm not saying don't wrap. I'm just saying consider the possible implications of it. Uh, this is a quotation from a 1964 book by Calvin Wells, a name you do not need to know, but it's a concept that holds up today. Um, I'll just read it. The pattern of disease or injury that affects any group of people is never a matter of chance. It is invariably the expression of stresses and strains to which they were exposed, a response to everything in their environment and behavior. Uh, when menstrual deformities and other complications, you know, that are best dress, uh, addressed by, by a physical therapist, when those emerge, it's unlikely to have been random, right? Just ba random bad luck. It's more likely uh, to have been developed through the application of inappropriate loads. Um, that's why it can be corrected uh, through changing of those loads, changing of the signaling patterns. This concept uh, has been understood for a long time, but the physiological mechanisms of cell signaling have been discovered much more recently. Uh, most of what we understand has been discovered in the last few decades. Things like integrin signaling, which we'll get into later, but um, very generally, uh, how stress gets interpreted by your skeletal muscle is through mechanotransduction, uh, which means mechanical stresses getting transmitted at the cellular level. Um, specificity of mechanotransduction means the cells respond to those stresses and loads very precisely. You can think of your muscle like a trampoline. It has, you know, all, you know, the, like if you're jumping on a trampoline, there's those springs around the edges. And depending on how you jump on that trampoline and how you land on it, those springs will deform differently. If you're jumping high, uh, you know, and then, and then landing, the, 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 
strain on the springs will be different um, from like bouncing on it a little. Uh, if you're jumping near one edge, the springs at the other edge uh, will deform differently. Um, if you're landing in a cannonball, you know, or a starfish or, or, or whatever, the straining uh, on the springs, they, they, they deform differently. And the same is true for skeletal muscle, except instead of springs, we have proteins uh, that serve those mechanotransduction roles like titan. You know, we've talked about that one. And integrins, which I've alluded to a couple of times, we haven't talked about it yet, but we will in detail in, in coming lectures. Uh, the point is we have proteins that behave like those springs in the trampoline and the loads uh, that they experience cause those proteins to deform differently and they inform the cell. They relay information about physical stimuli in the form of chemical signals and the, the cell's shape and their, and their function changes, the cells adapt. Uh, so if you're an orca and you have water pushing on one side of your fin all the time, what happens to your fin, right? If you're a human and you're constantly walking around with luggage in your right hand uh, and you aren't carrying anything in your left, what happens to your own musculoskeletal anatomy? Um, or if the biceps are are consistently stressed with muscular endurance during a 120 degree isometric hold, what happens to the biceps? We adapt specifically. Um, sometimes these are desirable adaptations. Sometimes they result in pathology. And other times uh, physical therapists are manipulating these loads, changing the mechanical inputs to fix those pathologies. Uh, but specificity of mechanotransduction is at the root of all of it. So let's summarize uh, the major points. We'll go through the uh, take-home messages. First, every source of stress is unique. Running at a six-minute mile pace is different from running at a seven-minute mile pace. Flat bench is different from incline bench. Breaststroke is different from butterfly. Um, second... Every adaptation is specific to that stress. Uh, that's Hans Selye on a Hungarian stamp from 2007. Um, just because he was famous, right? He was a famous scientist, doesn't mean he was right about everything. Uh, as um, Edward Adolph pointed out in the 50s, he was really wrong about generally adapting to things. Uh, and it's not just your muscle adapting. Uh, for point three here, it's your brain, your liver, your gallbladder, kidneys, blood vessels, enzymes, mitochondria, uh, transporter molecules, receptor cells, you know, like glands and whatever. All of this stuff, everything is constantly adapting. Um, those adaptations are intended to enhance our survival. Uh, in the words of, of Andrew Marvell, self-preservation nature's first great law. Uh, and you and me and every plant and animal that you've ever seen spends its entire life adapting to its environment, trying to be more appropriate or suitable to the profiles of stressors uh, it's threatened with, um, that environment threatens us with. That's what fitness means is becoming more appropriate or suitable um, to our environments. Uh, and lastly, uh, changing the loads, uh, changing the mechanical inputs is the basis of corrective exercise, which is the basis of physical therapy. Physical therapy is applied mechanotransduction. So that's it. That's it for today. Uh, last lecture before the exam. Just make sure you can answer these questions as well. Um, and uh, if you can answer these and all of the other review questions, you will be ready for that exam. Uh, and I will see you eventually in uh, lecture 13.